Okay, this year is given in memory of Rachelea Bas of Chaim Tzvi. So today we're starting something new. We're starting the Book of Daniel. The Book of Daniel is one of the most interesting books in Tanakh. In this, the, the narrative part, the actual life of Daniel, is fascinating and exemplary and um, inspiring. But what's more, his prophecies concerning our future as a people are prophecies that we've actually seen come true, so that his prophecies for the future beyond where we are today are actually our map of the era's unfolding. So it's a very important book in Tanakh, it's a very beautiful book in Tanakh. Um, what makes it interesting and challenging us, for those of us who will uh, be listening to the translation of the words, is that... Uh, most of Sefer Daniel is written in Aramaic, so you might develop your understanding of Aramaic as we learn, um, as we learn Daniel. Uh, those of you who are following with the Sefer, it might, it might be worth your while to take note of this, that the, um, the general Meforshep Shat do translate the Aramaic to ordinary Hebrew, so don't feel that you're going to necessarily be lost. So with that, let's begin. בשנת שלוש למלכות יהויקין, מלך יהודה, בא נפחד נצר מלך בבל יהושלים, ויצר עליה. It was in the third day, the third year, excuse me, of King Yehoiakim's rule, when נפחד נצר came, נפחד נצר, the king of Babel, came to Yerushalayim, and he did battle for it. So, what's going on here? Okay, so what we have here, Matsuta tells, tells us, that when it says it's the third year of Malchus Yehoiakim, it doesn't mean the third year from his became, becoming king, since we have explicit information elsewhere that that was not the case. That, um, that Yermiyahu said that in the fourth year of Yehoiakim, that year was the f- first year of Nebuchadnezzar. But what we do have now is that um, it was the third year of his rebellion, of of Yehoiakim's rebellion. Against the prophet's wishes, the kings of Israel had rebelled against the Babylonians. Okay, so um, how did that come about? Why were they rebelling and why did the prophets tell them not to? The reason why they were rebelling, and this is of course very uh, important for our understanding of current history, is that they thought that giving into it was um, the the ultimate mistake. The ultimate mistake was letting oneself be conquered. How, if you love the Jewish people, if you love the land of Israel, could you allow such a thing? Okay, they were right. It was the ultimate tragedy. The problem wrong in their thinking is that it wasn't a tragedy that could be prevented by human means, by the force of arms. It could only be, at that point, resolved through tshuva and through divine intervention. So because of this, we tend to, um, you know, it's a problem that we've always had, it's a problem we still have. When someone says be realistic, usually what they mean isn't be realistic, but be materially oriented. So um, realistically, they should have rebelled, it might have worked. Spiritually, it was a grave mistake. Okay, so... um, so with that in mind, let's go and see what happened in this battle. Ve'yitain Hashem biyado et Yehoiakim melech Yehuda mikzat kli bet ha'elokim ve'yevyem alert shinar bet elokav elohav ve'yatakelim hevi bet otza elohav. So Hashem, notice it isn't his failure. Hashem gave him Yehoiakim and some of the vessels of the Beis Hamikdash. To Nebuchadnezzar. So it wasn't a military tragedy, it wasn't a, strat- a strategic tragedy, it was from Hashem. So um, the way Hashem put together this, the first of all exiles, was um, in three stages. The first stage, the king, and some of the, uh, some but not all, of the um, vessels of the temple were taken. Okay, why was that? There was still time for them to, to hold, to draw things back to how they were. Okay, to make things different. 
But they didn't. And again, the mistake that was almost cast and die for them was attributing, was attributing these terrible events to anything other than their own spiritual condition. So after he took them, he took them to Eretz Shin'ar. What's, which place is Shin'ar? Shin'ar is Babylon. It's called Shin'ar because that's where things were no air. That's where things were shaken to after the flood. And they were put in the place of his idols, the place where his holy utensils were, the place of his own God's treasury. So that means that he, um, he wasn't threatened by the idea of God. He just wanted to own the idea of God. He wanted to be part of what he had. Vayomer HaMelech Lashpinaz Rav Sarisav Lavi Mibnei Yisrael Umizar HaMelucha Umin HaPartamim So he makes a request here. He speaks to one of his lords and um, he says to him, I would like to have you bring of Bnei Yisrael children who are of the royal family, of the nobles. Okay, why is he asking for them? We'll see his other qualifications. He wants to take the force and strength of, of Israel, which is their children, and use them for his own purpose, to turn them into good little Babylonians. So all of their energy, their intellect, their spiritual capacity, the depth and breadth of their souls would be dedicated towards him. 